So let's grab, obviously, with, a, with an episode that's supposed to cover from Psalm 1 through 49, <laughs> we're not even going to be able to cover a fraction of the, of the chapters here, but let's grab a couple of concepts along the way. Some of them we're going to have uh, Michael share some, some more music with us along the way, but let's jump into chapter 2. Notice the significance. Now, we just got through talking about psalms that are messianic in nature. See if you can recognize that in verse 6 and 7. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Now, if you're familiar with Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the synoptic uh, gospel writers in the New Testament, they all will give us this, this experience at the baptism where you hear the voice of God speaking from heaven. Now, Matthew's account is slightly different by, by a couple of words than Mark and Luke's, but this psalm, Psalm 2 verse 7, is what is recorded in the New Testament as the voice of God. Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee, through the baptism. It's kind of neat to see that here you get Heavenly Father, the way he's communicating to the people is through a hymn, a, a snippet of a hymn that they would all be very familiar I with. I love this. This, this, is, this so inspires the songwriter in me. It's one of my favorite lines is sometimes a song can teach me the truth the only way my heart can hear it. That's right. And this is, I think, an example of that. That's right. I think for them to hear words that they would have already been familiar with brings with it the rest of Psalm 2 into their soul and their testimony of Christ on that day is a little more rooted by the river. Let's build a bit into this from the context. In the ancient Near East, particularly for the Israelites, the idea was that the king was divinely appointed and either the direct son of God or adopted by God and therefore of a divine nature and therefore had the right to rule on the throne and to represent God and to bring the peace and stability that he first provided after chaos was put in its place at the creation. So the king on his throne is like God completing creation and having a Sabbath, a rest. That was the purpose of kingship. And to designate who the appropriate king is, that king would be told, you are my son. This is exactly what we have in verse 6 and 7. I have set my king upon my holy hill. I will declare the decree, thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee. So for any ancient Israelite, it would have been unmistakable. If you had ever heard the phrase, Son of God, applied to a human, you would know that is the king, that's the anointed one. Let's go back to those, the, to the Gospels. Mark in particular is very interesting. Mark doesn't give us the birth of Jesus Christ. Notice how Mark tries to forefront what he thinks is the most important identity of who Jesus is. He begins at baptism, and he starts by quoting the Psalm, Psalm chapter 2. Jesus is baptized, and coming up out of the water, this is verse 10, he saw the heavens opened, and the Spirit like a dove descending upon him. And by the way, I was in Israel recently at, the, at a baptismal site that may have been where Jesus was baptized, and white doves were flying by. It's absolutely amazing. And there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Now, we've all heard that through the ages. What's interesting, if we were an ancient Israelite living in the time of Je uh, Jesus, we would know immediately, this is the Messiah. This is the King. This is God's chosen anointed one who's going to be on the throne to bring Sabbath rest. All the chaos of life will be put at bay because of this chosen one. I find those, those connections very powerful that Mark wants us to know. His testimony of Jesus, among other things, is, Jesus is the anointed Messiah, the one who will put to peace all that we have suffered in life, all the chaos of our life. It comes right out of the Psalms, Psalm chapter 2. Beautiful. Now, now, speaking of chaos of life, recognize that David, King David, is associated with roughly 73 
of the 150 Psalms, almost half. And you know something of David's history, and you know something of David's ability with the music and the harp and the viols and the, the instruments. He, he was known as a great musician and songwriter. And so, as he gets older in life, and he starts to see things more for what they really are, for, for that which is the world's um, perspective versus those things that are real, you see him shift to many of his psalms pleading for mercy, um, praising the Lord, pleading for forgiveness, um, and you, you see it coming through. You can just feel his, his heart drawing up to heaven saying, is there hope for me? Is this real? So, if you just kind of look at some of these chapter headings, chapter 3, David cries unto the Lord and is heard, salvation is of the Lord. David pleads for mercy. Uh, look at 5, David asks the Lord to hear his voice. David cries unto the Lord for mercy, chapter 6. 7, David trusts in the Lord, who shall judge the people. And then let's pause here in 8, a messianic psalm of David. Uh, this is this is a really profound psalm, actually, where we want to we want to pause for a minute and focus on a couple of verses here. Um, Michael had an experience yesterday with this particular psalm. I I I um I was going through all the psalms that that you were going to be talking about, and this is this is interesting to me. Psalm eight jumped out at me, and as I'm reading it. And it has a really famous line about um, what is man that thou art mindful of him. And as I was reading through each one of these lines, I pictured David with his guitar or harp, and he's trying to express, and I'm thinking while he's expressing his awe of what God has done in this messianic thing, what if I made it into this short song based on these lyrics? And here's what I came up with. It, if God made me a little lower than the angels, if God crowned me with glory in his name, if I'm a ruler or the works of heaven, then why does hell make me feel so ashamed? As I reflect on all that God's created, what is man that God's mindful of me? And so I pray my heart will be aided forevermore to be more mindful of thee. And I pictured him saying, if he's mindful of me, maybe the lesson is, how can I be more mindful of him? You know, that is really profound in that if we're not careful, the, the easy temptation to give into is to read scriptures like this and keep a very safe arm's distance to say, whew, yeah, David, he, he had serious problems. But I think if the Lord were here, I think he would say, this isn't about David. The, the situation with David is between the Lord and David. But these scriptures are preserved and written and brought to us and translated and transmitted through all these generations of time into our world today to become a handbook, more than just a handbook, a handbook for you and me to ask these exact same questions. I need this just as much as David needed this in different ways, but I need this. And that's a profound reminder.